This is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show. There he is. How you feeling, baby? Locked and loaded in front of the book stand. Yes, yes sir. indeed. My spot, my spot. I'm good, man. How are you? Good. What's your favorite book, or are those just there for uh, for pretty? No, they are not just here to look pretty. Um, I really like this one from Stuart Scott, Every Day I Fight. <laughs> uh, this was a book he wrote while he was dealing with cancer before he died. And I so, just love uh, busting your balls saying that it was there for pretty. You're like, no, no, it's not there for pretty. I've actually read some of these. Oh, what the hell's wrong I've, with you? I've read all of them. The Four <laughs> Agreements is another classic of, uh as well, I've read every book up here. <laughs> okay, so so by the way, the Malcolm, stewards got Malcolm one. X, Malcolm X, that was another one oh, of my favorites. Nice, um, nice. What did what did uh, give me a Stuart Scott something from that book that you really liked because he was such a likable dude, bro, and obviously creative as hell. You know, all, all his sayings stuck with us forever, and we'll, we'll carry them forever. So, so. 2015, I had to get the date, January 4th, 2015 is when he finished this book and he had cancer for eight years before this book came out. And so like, I think what I took mostly away is like, like him trying to live his life through this debilitating disease and like not letting it define him. Like most of us didn't know he had cancer until like the final year of his life. And he meant it that way. For a purpose he went about his job he did it the way he wanted and essentially like he has that quote that's become famous like you know you beat cancer by the way you live in the manner in which you live right and so like ultimately he may quote unquote have lost the battle with cancer because he died but i think the stories he tells throughout kind of shows how he actually won the legacy he left with his daughters the legacy he left on people like me who grew up wanting to have the personality um, but also be on TV in a in an area where there's not a lot of us black folk um, in those lanes. And so I really enjoyed to hear like his personal journey, his per- personal influences and how he felt comfortable um, being himself in his own shoes um, in an industry that typically didn't look like him or act like him. And so that gave me a lot of motivation to do my job the way I do my job. And so that was a uh, that was a pretty that was probably my biggest takeaway from this book. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool because he he was obviously a dude that was a, a trendsetter in his own right. And it takes a lot of courage, dude. Yeah. Carry that around with you as a burden. And you you have to overcome it every day and live your life. And and nobody knows about it. And you're living with that. It's, Absolutely. That, that takes a lot of bravery, man. It does. It does. Man. Um, let's uh let's get into this uh game. Um, I, I, you know, the one thing that you can come away with, if we're going to put some kind of a positive spin on it, if you give me this defense the rest of the way, um, man, Mike, figure out your offensive stuff, bro, because you're, you, you, you now have the combination. If you could figure out a way to be better offensively in the games that you need to be in and that defense shows up. You, you're a Super Bowl contender. Yeah, so it's interesting how this season's gone, right? The first, what, month, month and a half, almost two months of the season, we're looking at this team as like this offense is elite, the best in the league, and we just need the defense to catch up. Now the defense is catched, caught up, and the offense is going through a little bit of a, I would just call it a lull. They haven't been bad. They just have kind of maybe dropped to maybe an average offense compared to league best historic numbers, right? And so a lot of the injuries have caught up to them, the pre-snap penalties, the mistakes, and now the offense has to figure it out. But the thing about Vangio, and I know a lot of people were critiquing him early, um, his scheme from all the people I talked to takes time to be able to um, learn and and really uh, buy into like I was talking to guys from week three, week four, week five, and it was still like they're trying to get comfortable doing what they're told, like doing your job in those particular elements. And now it feels like it's clicking for Bradley Chubb. It, he said it felt like in the New York game, it clicked for him. And for other guys, it probably was not too long after. And now you're seeing 
you know, your Bradley Chubbs, your Christian Wilkins, your Jack Sealers, your, your Jalen Phillips, your Andrew Van Ginkles, all playing really good on the line. And then you have the back end dudes who are now finally locking it down. You know, Ramsey's there. People not even looking at Ramsey's side of the field. Like you pull up the numbers, he's not being targeted. Two are completely avoiding him. And then they're completely avoid next too, because they know he can pick the ball off. And so you're 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 essentially seeing teams say, hey, where can I beat them? And there's not a lot of options. Maybe in the slot, um, caters, you know, they, they attacked cater a few times last week, but ultimately this defense is shaping up to be what they are. They told me at the start of the season they wanted to be with the top five unit. So I mean top 10 unit. So over the last couple of weeks, three or four weeks, they've been a top 10 defense for sure. So that's something of optimism. I know a lot of this week has been the narrative of they can't win big team against good teams. And, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about that. There's something to that. Um, but if you take some positives going into the break, it's that this defense is starting to feel like it's getting his legs. Yeah, no, I mean, and unfortunately, that's the burden they have to carry. Those right. are the facts. You're not stepping up against the better teams. And 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 listen, in the end, this last game here, you were right there, dude, to be quite right. honest. And really, Tyreek alone lost that game with the fumble. Uh, even though I gotta blame Smythe also, because God, his you know, he's missed way too many blocks this year, by the way. Mm -hmm. Way too many for being your yeah. block tight end. I've seen Smythe screw up blocks way too many, and that was his biggest screw up because it led to the fumble. And then the, you know, Tua put that bomb right in his hands. That would have led to points too. And you got to make those kind of your elite players have to be elite in these kind of games. And he was not elite against his former team. So this was a situation. And then the other things, you know, some of the bad habits from Mike McDaniel continue to rear its ugly head. And these are the things that are kind of burning yourself. You know, he talked about it in the game. He talked about it in the press conference, which I know people may look at it and say, oh, well, he's not giving credit to the other team. But actually, if you look at it, it's them burning themselves consistently right. Right. overall. And you really can't point the fingers at anybody else, but, at the, you know, look in the mirror. And that's what's going on with the Dolphins on so, offense. So and so I kind of I tweeted about this a little bit and, you know, it stirred up some thoughts because I said and I've said this on TV that the narrative is not as much of a narrative as a, as is truth. Like you can say all you want about the oh, well, the media is saying this about us. But the reality is they're zero three against teams with a winning record. They've lost six straight games dating back to last year with teams with a winning record. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they won't win those games in the future. Right. Like Jalen Ramsey went on a rant about how his Rams team lost a lot of games in the regular season. Thank you. Outlier. Um, and, Outlier. And, and, and then it ended up winning the Super Bowl. So there yeah. is precedent of teams still surviving through losses to win. But yeah, but it makes I, I don't use an outlier. I don't use an outlier as some right. kind but of it makes it it makes it harder, right? And and the reality is it's not just a media narrative. That's why I think like that's a convenient thing to say. But like I've talked to guys in the locker room who who mention it as something that they, you know, they think about, that they want to be able to get over that hurdle for their own, you know, you know, satisfaction, their own uh, confirming of who they are. And so I, I think that, you know, the, the, the self-inflicted elements are key because they have made these same mistakes, I would say, against worse teams. Like, remember Carolina? They went down 14 nothing, and they yeah. were making mistakes early. They just were so much better than Carolina that they were able to overcome those mistakes. They've had these games where this is truly who they've been. They've had drop passes. They've had penalties, and they just can get away with them against the better teams. They don't regress against these good teams. They just can't get away with as much. And so that's the test of a as a good team. When you face the better teams, who's going to make the least mistakes? Who's going to make the least turnovers? Who's going to step it up? And the reality is the Dolphins are a good team. Um, we just don't know if they're a great team. And, you know, that's what defines the great teams. I think I think it's also like a a sort of a um, a punishment of being good, so to speak. Right. The Dolphins were so good, so explosive that I think they were put into the elite category um, and considered an elite team before they had shown it yet. And so right now they're being judged as if they are an elite team. 
If they weren't put in that category, people would say, oh, well, they're six and three. They lead the AFC East. Like, what's the issue? If you would have told them six and three leading the AFC East and started a season, they would have been like, sign me up, right? But your right. your your bar has risen because of how good Tua, McDaniel, the offense have looked over the first half of the season. And you're like, man, this team is not only a good team, they should be a Super Bowl team. They should be this and that. And so because of these recent losses, I think it probably lowers the bar back down. And that's why you're getting a little bit more critique from the media and fans don't like it. But when you become the big dog, when you start to have expectations, people start expecting a level of play from you. If you don't live up to the level of play that the expectations were, then you're going to get some dockage. So still a good team. We don't know yet if they are a great team. And that's what I think the point is with the can't beat good teams, good physical teams on the road. That's what shows you're a great team and they're not there yet. Um, talk to me about the offensive line. First of all, what do we know about the Isaiah Wynn injury? Because all we know is long road, but we don't really know what kind of a road are we talking about. Are we talking about a road that we're, ta- we're talking about? From what I understand, it's, it's one like, that he returns, or bro, there's- from what I understand, it's very unlikely that he plays again this season. Okay, so okay. that's what he's referencing. I think McDaniel's trying to be kind to Isaiah Wynn because Isaiah Wynn's probably still trying to fight to come back for, you know, a late playoff run type deal. And so And so you don't want to crush a guy's dreams and say, hey, no, forget about rehab, just playing for April, right? You want right. a guy to push and have a goal in mind. I'm sure Isaiah Wynn, like Jalen Ramsey, is like, hey, they're telling me I'm going to be out, let's say, four months. That puts me into February. Let me see if I can push it and get back for a playoff run, right? And so it's not out of the realm, but I would say that it's unlikely. And I would say the Dolphins are planning as if they will not have them again this season. They're planning as if their left guard will be some combination of Lester Cotton, Liam Eikenberg, Robert Jones when he's healthy. Um, that'll be one of the the three left guard. One of those three will be the left guard for the rest of the season. And so I'm not expecting Isaiah went back. They aren't expecting Isaiah went back. And when it's just trying to hope that he can have a miracle. So I, I think that's that's his way of saying our group is our group. Don't count on an Isaiah win, you know, coming in to save the season. So Hunt will be back, you think, uh, after the bye week? Yes, it, it sounds like like nothing official. They'll obviously get him back on the field next week and see how he's feeling. But it sounded like he was trending towards having a chance to play this week if they had a game. And so you give that another week. I, I'd say that he's got a he's got a decent chance of being back. So if that's the case, you would have four of your five week one starters in the offensive line. So probably the healthiest you've been so far this season with Teron, Connor Williams, Robert Hunt, Austin Jackson. And it would just be that left guard spot that is uh that is kind of a revolving door. Um, I haven't rewatched it. What'd you think? I, I know that during the game I watched those two big runs by Mostert, Eichenberg had key blocks on those yeah I can't yeah say, i can't say overall how he did or did you re-watch what'd you think of eichenberg at left guard and then to back up also the eichenberg thing you know at one point or another i have to give this man a little love because he's been moved around everywhere mm-hmm. and then they want him to settle at center and he actually was getting better at center as he continued to play while connor was out and now he stepped in in a pinch at left guard. I just want to give the man some credit because his professionalism throughout all of this and th- and through his struggles has been just, you know, a, a, from one to ten, a ten. I just got to right. say the way he has been has handled himself, and I thought he did a serviceable job. I haven't really looked at it completely, but I'm wondering what you thought about Eichenberg overall. Yeah, I don't think that he was a huge liability, which had been the case in previous weeks. Um, I will say, like, the Dolphins did a lot to try to help uh, on Chris Jones inside because they know how he can wreck that game. And so there was a lot of, <laughs> predictably, double coverages on on um, on Chris Jones. And so there was some help, which is fine. Like, most teams, even the Eagles, give help if they're playing Chris Jones, and they probably have the best offensive line of football. And so it's not a, not a knock. It's just a reality. He, there was a lot of help. It's Chris Jones. And, yeah, it's, Chris it's Chris Jones. Jones. It's Chris Jones. Like, it, it really does not matter who's out there. There's not – I don't think there's a single offensive lineman in football that feels great about going one-on-one on Chris Jones all game. 
It's just not yeah. something that people do. And so um, that would be my take there. But I also think that um, what what the Chiefs did well, and I think it's less of an offensive line issue. Like I think a lot of times people look at the numbers and I tweeted out Tua was pressured 29 percent of his uh, snaps uh, this past game. Most he's had all season. And the natural reaction is, oh, well, the offensive line stinks. I told you guys the injuries will become too much. And the offensive line didn't have a great game per se. But the biggest thing I noticed when I watched that game and looked at it back was the Chiefs' intentionality to disrupt the receivers in the first five yards. They were getting hands on them. They were pushing them off their routes. They were pushing Tyreek around. Like they were, they were finding ways to disrupt that timing to where they were not able to get to the plays they wanted to get to as smoothly as they wanted. And it forced Tua to hold on to the ball. I don't want to bore you with numbers, but like one of the key stats I saw this week, uh, 16 of Tua's 34 passes, he held the ball for 2.5 seconds or more. And that is the most, he's the most, the highest share of all season for Tua. He's quickly a guy who's getting the ball out 2.2, 2.3 seconds. Like his time to throw is best in the league. And so he was having a lot of, more than two and a half second plays, which means that he's having to clutch. He's having to go to the second read. He's having to go to the third read. The most, you play, at the end. The most right. play at the end was a perfect Absolutely. example where you just held it too long. And by the time you threw it to Moster, there was a dead play. Right. And you didn't make a quick decision right. at that moment. And that was on him, unfortunately. You know, get rid of it or something. But you Absolutely. almost and that's the blessing and the curse, right? Because it's, this offense is so excellent when it's rolling, when the timing is right, when everything is fluid, when they're moving, that motion is flowing. People are like, man, how do you stop it? It's impossible. But if you get that timing off, even a nick, it, it disrupts the flow of the offense. And so that's the adjustment period because most people don't have the confidence to try to press Tyreek Hill because it's like, what if I miss? <laughs> that's, that's the big question. What if I miss? It's over, right? The Chiefs seem to have the confidence of not worrying about what if I miss and what happens if I make? What happens if I do get hands on them? What happens if I do disrupt the timing of the route? And the reason they were able to do that is they have an elite defensive line that they trust to get home. And they've got some dogs at corner. Trent McDuffie and uh, and Legereus Neve are are two of the top young corners in football. And neither of those guys looked afraid of Tyreek Hill. They played a lot of zone coverage, gave Tyreek a lot of help. They also were really physical with him in the line. And I think that affected uh, the pressures that were on Tua. Um, The offense on the road is different than at home. Um, And and look, for me, whether it's the coach abandoning the run at the end when Moster was gouging them, dude. I mean, I would not have stopped running Mm -hmm. until he stopped it, especially with all the time and the timeouts you had. Right. were in the driver's seat at that moment, you know, mm-hmm. and to me that lacked common sense. And he's done that at times where he gets a little too cute. And then it's at the same time, his offense is not nearly as effective on the road than it is at home. Mm-hmm. So coaching has to improve too. And I know, see, here's the difference, you know, so I can get the golfing fans off my ass here. Um, I was not impressed as time went on with Gase or Flo or Philbin or Cam or what I'm impressed with this guy. Yeah. So I'm not here. I'm not here to give up on Mike McDaniel or anything like that. But as a young coach, there's a couple of things that he has to fix. And I understand this too. He's the head coach and the offensive coordinator, which is a bitch for a experienced coach, much mm-hmm. less a second year guy. But right. This, but this has to end, bro. Mm -hmm. Your team has to play better. You got to stop having the pre-snap penalties. You got to stop with the inconsistent play calling. You got to stop abandoning the run. You got to have a better offense on the road, whether it's motion or whatever, the communication between the quarterback and the, and the center, this has to be cleaned up. And by the way, I don't even blame the snap that much on Connor because I've watched Tua catch the low ones and the high ones and complete the pass. Right. So, the one that's here, you better catch it, bitch. I don't care. That's on Tua. All of it is on Tua. I don't even put an ounce of it on Connor. You got to be awake here. But my point is, it falls all on the coach. If your team can't play clean, and if your coach can't call a clean game. So to me, 
there's a lot of fixing that has to be done inside McDaniel's head. So I think there's a lot of truth to the road element, um, which is why it's continues to brought up. Like I think the, and I've tried to talk to some of the coaches about this, to get a little bit of insight. So much of their offense is based off um, feel timing. Right. And so, so much of it is getting the chemistry of Tyree kill is going to do this motion and it takes him two and a half seconds to cross the field. Connor snaps the ball in 0.3 seconds, and I'm going to hit him here, right? When you're not able to signal vocally, you have to go to silent counts. People don't really know the feel, the timing as much. And so it just seems off when they're on the road. Everything within the offense just seems to tick off. And I told you just how important that flow is of the offense. And so that's something they need to work on because I know they've piped in noise some weeks into the facility, but what they are doing clearly is not impacting their ability to not have pre-snap penalties, not have the flow of the offense. And so you don't want to be a whole different team on the road than you are at home. You don't want to say, Hey, we can't run these motions because you know, we just can't, we're not fluid enough communication wise. And so you become a different team. Uh, as far as the run game element you were talking about, it's an interesting thing with Mike McDaniel because Last year, he talked about struggling to uh, stay committed to the run game and apologizing to the running backs for that. He's been a lot better this year in running the ball as far as frequency. Um, but one thing that does typically happen in game flow for him, if they get jumped on early and teams have success stopping the run in the first quarter, he will typically go away from it. And so that is something that I think teams have put on their scouting report. If we go all out on stopping the run in the first quarter and we have success, and our offense gets up, then maybe they become one-dimensional in their own right. And the Dolphins did that for a couple of quarters, and they finally, in the fourth quarter, started to get back to Raheem Mostert, and he popped off those two big runs. Um, but I think it's 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 the the mindset thing of, hey, I want to stay committed, but if we struggle, I got Tyreek and Waddle, and that's my best way to score. And so I don't know if I have a huge issue with how McDaniel is calling the games. I just think that he's going through a flow of, um, what's best for his team and um, the desire. Oh, hold on. Let me Go. stop you there. Let Go. me stop you there. So what's best for your team is to put Cedric Wilson in a hot read situation where you don't have a lot of time and the quarterback knows you don't have a lot of time. So he reads that he doesn't have a lot of time. So he throws the hot read yet that receiver reads different and goes long. Clearly Cedric Wilson screwed up there. He's yeah. He was not going to throw him under the bus, and neither is the coach. But you got to use Waddle or Tyreek in those kind of situations. This reminds me of, this is consistent, Buffalo last year. You okay. put Brandon Sanders in a situation that he was not ready for, and he cuts off the route, and, and Tua throws a beautiful bomb that if the kid goes running in stride, he has a touchdown. And you put a youngster that wasn't ready for the situation and you did the same thing with Cedric Wilson I get he's becoming a bigger part of the offense but he hasn't done enough to put him in that situation to me that's a bad decision by the coach he's putting people in positions that they're not ready to succeed and help you out so I think the issue is kind of what you mentioned they have not had a third receiver separate themselves they tried and thought that Braxton Berrios was going to be that guy early um, he has not been able to separate off press coverage and get open. And so Cedric Wilson has sort of taken over his role. Um, well. They were playing Craycraft early, but then Craycraft got hurt. They were trying to use Eric Azucama, and then Eric Azucama got hurt. And so now with Cedric again, it's like they don't really have that three. Oh, they will now. They will now. He'll be back. He'll be back. Right. Craycraft right. Will be. River Craycraft's going to be back. And guess who's going to be playing? Guess who's going to know his route? Guess who's going to be exactly where you need him to be? River Craycraft. And so that is why he's on the team. And I think that that return is definitely going to help them in that positioning. What River Craycraft may lack in athleticism, he gains in knowing exactly where to be, knowing what the defense presents and finding the right zones and blocking. He's their best blocking receiver. And so all of those things will increase his reps. And I'm sure in three weeks, we're going to be talking about well, why is River Craycraft getting all the snaps over Chase Claypool and Cedric Wilson and, and Braxton Berrios. And it's going to be, remember this conversation after the Chiefs game when we're talking about this and that. 
that's the reality of it. Another thing briefly that I want to uh, mention. Hey, by uh, the way, he's he's a precise route runner. Yes, and for absolutely. A, and for a precise thrower. Yes, come on, that's dude. so key. That's so come key. On. It's so come key. On. And one thing briefly here, and I know we we'll probably have to go in a sec for another guest, but um, I thought McDaniel was pretty transparent talking about how unlucky Jalen Waddle's season's been. He's dealt with injuries all year. He hasn't been 100% for most of the year. You've seen a guy at 75% or, or worse kind of battle through stuff, whether it be the back, whether it be the knee. He had an oblique early in the season. It's been a little thing by little thing, and you can tell he's not able to have the impact he's normally able to have. And so I think that's impacting the offense as well because you're not able to, to lean on Jalen Waddle when teams go heavy on Hill and say, we're going to double Hill, we're going to do all this on Hill. Jalen Waddle hasn't been able to have that same explosion, that same impact that he normally does. And so I think that's limited the offense. So McDaniel said we're going to use his body. Armstead's the same shit. You know, yeah. Armstead has not gotten injured by just normal injuries that he has. It's right. all in bad luck that somebody hit him. Right. And that's how he got his two injuries are weren't out of his control at all, dude. It had right. nothing to do with him. It wasn't like he pulled a hammy, like what he normally does. What normally happens to Teron Armstead, he's actually been very lucky in that sense where he's been completely unlucky. Dude, he gets sideswiped by somebody. Poor guy, right. dude. Like absolutely, hey, God, I feel bad for him, dude, because he yeah, unlucky. Unlucky is a great word. He's been he, but it's the facts. He's been unlucky. Yep. I feel terrible. I got. I know I got to let you go here, but the Claypool thing, is it that he's a slow learner, or what's the deal? Because it's several weeks, and I just need you to learn a fade pattern, bro. I, I got. I think this I gotta, is a complex. I think this is a complex offense to learn. I also think the Dolphins intended his role to be situational. I don't think the thought was ever, hey, Claypool's going to come in and get 75% of our reps. I think the thought was he's going to be a package player who does things in situations, and they're still trying to figure out what's best for him as he learns that offense, right? Because a lot of what they probably want to do with him involves motion, involves him doing assignment-based football. And as we saw, Cedric Wilson's been in this offense for two years, and he may still make some mistakes there. And so you want to make sure he's knowing exactly what he's supposed to do, where he's lined up, what he's expected to do. But I do think once, he, you know, this bye week will help. And once he's fully in the offense, I still don't expect him to have this huge playtime jump. I think although he's not a guy that needs a lot of motion, because he's just going to push the guy aside that's in front of him. If he right, wants. but he's a fast guy. He's a fast guy, and so yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Like remember all the stuff they were doing with Eric Azukama early in the season with some. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if eventually he gets some of that because everybody's expecting the ball to go to a Tyree Kill when you do that type of motion or Jalen Waddle. A part of this offense is the misdirection, the confusion. If you get Tyreek or Waddle going one way and then you can get Claypool going the other, that's that's a propensity for big plays. And that's how they had a couple of those with Eric Ezukama because people will just forget about you because you're not Tyreek or Waddle. And so they've been needing those guys, those secondary weapons who don't draw much attention to step up in those uh, misdirection plays. So Having a chan back will help in that respect, too, because it's another weapon that you have to worry about. Um, but I, I do think you'll see Claypool a little bit more in the slot gadget type roles rather than him taking a full time role as a number three receiver. There you go. Follow him on Twitter at Cameron Wolf and catch his exceptional work, as always, at the NFL Network. Cam, thank you, sir. We will catch up later on in the week. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Appreciate you. Thank you, sir. KSD TCPAs, they are hiring, man. Dade Broward, Palm Beach counties, and they've got an office in North Carolina. They can handle your business taxes, year-end planning, payroll, sales taxes. Uh, they can do it all for you, state and local taxes, uh, estate and trust. They handle all of that, folks. International taxation, they can help your company if you do all of that. In, in that area, they can help you also make sure you call them at 305-670-3370. They do it all. Personal taxes, business taxes, tax advisory, assurance, and accounting. They are a top 200 firm by Forbes. KSDT CPAs, 
Use that QR code and reach out to the great people at KSDT CPA. This is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show.